Um, it's good to see you all. Hi, uh, girls. All right. Jonah. Okay. Good to see everybody. Awesome. We were t- we've been, we've been kind of doing some things about the uh, difference between Old Covenant and the New Covenant. Okay. And to understand that the Old Covenant was for the old man. You understand? The Old Covenant was for the old man. So as long as you're unsaved, or you, know, you don't have a new man, you don't have a new spirit, that Old Covenant is for you. But when you become born again, and you receive a new man, a new nature, a new spirit, right? Then, you're, then that's for the New Covenant. You can't do both. So the Old Covenant was for the old man, the new covenant's for the new man, okay? And so that's what we find out. Now, what happens is, um, where did I say I was going? Oh, 13. Okay, so Paul's writing, I just want to kind of see where I want to start at. He's writing about the, the, the commandments, okay? And in, in verse 9, and in verse 10, he said that love does no harm to a neighbor. All right? Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. And what, you want to fulfill the law? The law is fulfilled in love. Okay? That's how the law is fulfilled, in love. Now, then he says this. Now, watch. And do this, knowing the time that now it's high time to wake out of sleep, for now our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Therefore, let us cast off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly, as in the day, not in revelry and drunkenness, or lewdness and lust, or strife and envy, but put on. Now, this is something here. This is where we see free will, okay? Because this is an act that you have to do. This is, it is not automatic, okay? This means this is a deliberate action to put something on. Put on the Lord Jesus Christ. And can I just say this? If, if, you have to, if, if you can put him on, guess what else you could do? You can put him off, okay? And see, this is, so why do Christians, born-again believers, slip into sin, slip into error? Because they put him off. They put him off, okay? And so it says to put, you put him on, and then what? Watch this. And make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lusts. You know why people sin? Because they make provision for it. They make provision for it. I don't know how it happened. I just, I just started chatting with somebody online, and then they said they wanted to meet me for a drink, and I thought, what's the harm? And I met them, and I, I don't know how I ever got into this relationship. I never meant for it to happen. You didn't mean for it to happen, but you made provision for it, and then wonder why it happened. You, I don't know why. I just started going the. It was such a fun trip to go out to Las Vegas. It was. We just had a great time. I started going down, and and and, and the food was good. But I started betting and stuff, and now you're now you're you're addicted to gambling. I don't know how that happened. Well, you made provision for it. See, so anything we slip into, whatever it is. What happens, and the reason that people step into sin and get into where they can't get out, they made provision for it. And as they made the provision for it, it was easy to get, start to give in to it. You understand? When we make a provision for it. And so it's just kind of better to nip it in the bud, right? And not, not make the provision in the first place. And what happens is when you start to make provision for it, it's so much easy to slip into. You know? You, you, you struggle... You know, people struggle with their certain addictions, struggle with alcohol, and it's like, I struggle, you know, gee, I just struggle with alcohol. I didn't mean for that to happen last night, to get all, you know, wasted like that, but all I did was I went to the bar just to have a couple of drinks. It's like, okay, well, you see, you made, pro- I didn't intend to drink that much. Well, you might not have intended, but if you weren't there in the first place, maybe it wouldn't have happened, you know what I mean? And so this is what people do, and then they wonder why it happens, or why they get stuck in this stuff, because they make a provision for it. And anytime you make provision for it, that's, you're fulfilling the lusts of it, okay? And what's happening? 
It's identifying. The temptation is identifying with something inwardly. Remember me talking about this Sunday. There's already the inward, okay, desire there. And when you start making provision outwardly for it, those two start to connect, okay? And that's when it, when it gives in. Uh, temptation is not sin, okay? But temptation can lead to sin when you give in to it, okay? Jesus was tempted. He never sinned. So we all get tempted. It's making the provision for it, okay? Learning where to set boundaries, I always talk to young people about boundaries, especially in relationships, you know, that if you don't set the boundary ahead of time, if you just think it's just, you know, if you just think you're going to enter into a relationship, okay, and it, it, that, that things are going to be okay, that you're just going to be able to stop at the right time, you're going to be able to say no when those times come out, you're not going to be able to unless you set boundaries ahead of time. You already have to have this boundary set up, okay, because if not, you're going you're gonna, to, the lust will start to lead you down the wrong path, okay? So now Paul goes into this. So he's, he's talking about putting on Christ. He's talking about not giving provision for the flesh. Now he's talking about what, in, in chapter 14, we'll start with verse 1. It says, receive one who is weak in the faith, but not to disputes over doubtful things. So it says to receive them. So, you know, you look at certain people and they have, they struggle in certain areas, they can be what we would consider weak in the faith. They might not have the same faith level. And it says receive them, okay? Not, not to argue with them, okay, that type of thing. That's not what we're looking for. Not to dispute over doubtless things. Because one believes that he can eat all things. You know, not everybody believes that. One believes they can eat all things. He who's weak eats only vegetables. What's it say? Vegetarians are weaklings, huh? <laughs> all right. We're meat eaters. We're better than you. Okay? So we have to look at, you know, different things like that. Um, <clears throat> different people have different levels wherever they're at. Paul's going to use food in this example here, but it can go anywhere. You know, I, I'll have people call me up, and, and they're like, ah, oh, I'm not feeling well. Do you think I should go to the doctor? You know, I, don't ask me that question. I cannot answer for you. Okay? I, that's between, that's up to you. You must follow your own heart, your own conviction in that area. I'm not a doctor person. I just, I don't even have a doctor. Okay, I'm not a medication person. I'm not against it. This is not for me. Okay, so when you ask me my opinion, that's a level of faith that I, I tend to walk in. There might be other areas that I don't tend to walk in, but that one I kind of do. So if you ask me, you know, I can't tell you what to do there. I can't tell you whether you should go to the doctor or not. That's going to be up to you whether you want to go to the doctor. I, I don't know how you feel. Some people have low pain tolerance, you know, I don't know. And some people just, they're different that way, you know. I can maybe tell you, well, if it was me, you know, we've, I've been on, uh, I've gone all over the world, and they tell you that you should take shots to go travel, okay. I remember the first time we traveled, you know, well, you should get, you need to get, they tell you you need to get malaria shots, you need to do, I don't get them. But I'm not against people to do get them, that's up to them. That's they, where, where, where are they at? You know, if they want to get, if they're comfortable with that, it's, you're better off to do that than walk in fear, okay? If you're comfortable and you feel that that's good for you, then, then that's okay. I'm not judging you for it. That's, your, that's where you're at. I don't take them. I, you know, I've been Africa. I've been Amazon jungle and things like that. I just don't feel to take them. You know, I don't want that stuff, but that's me. But I'm not putting that on somebody else, okay? If somebody else wants to do that, I'm not going to judge them for it. I'm not going to say, well, you're just, you know, don't have any faith. I'm not going to say that. That's, that's between them and, and God and, and how they feel in their own bodies, you know. I think that's fine. You want to get, there's a, what, vaccines are out there now? You want to go out and get a vaccine? That's, that's up to you. I'm not going to tell you not to do it uh, or tell you to do it. I, I'm just, you know, me, I'm not going to do it, but that's me, okay? You can do whatever you're comfortable with and whatever you feel. You, that's between you and God. Seek the Lord on those kind of things. If you feel that you should get a vaccine and, you know, I'm not going to tell you not to. I wouldn't, but that's me. Okay. One believes he can eat all things, one, but he's weak, eats only vegetables. Let not, watch this, let not him who eats despise him who doesn't eat. You know, we don't have to make vegan jokes. Okay, things like that. All right, good. Let not him who does not eat judge him who eats. Kind of go, go both ways, right? Okay. For God has received him. So we don't have to look at one another and feel that we're superior or inferior or however, you know, you want to look at somebody because of a certain way that you approach certain things, okay? Especially when it comes, this is all going back to the law, right? Because that's what the law does. 
the law puts every person under condemnation. That's what it does. We saw that before. Okay? Who are you to judge another servant? To his own master he stands or falls. Indeed, he will be made to stand, for God is able to make him stand. One person esteems one day above another. Yeah, it's not me. Some people do that. They're real excited about that. They, they have special days, special things, special events. You know, well, I just really observe this day more. This day's really special. And like, to me, they're all the same. Okay? I'm not even into celebrating birthdays. I mean, it's just a day to me. It's just another day. What'd you do for your birthday? I don't know. I got up, mowed the lawn, did this and that, you know. But, you know, nothing special, really. I don't really, you know, I'm not a real big, I'm not a real big date type person, and, and, and praise God I married a woman who wasn't either, because that would be a real, you got to really, <laughs> that wouldn't work so good if one of them really is, and you know, and the other one isn't, so she's not either. Half the time we forget our anniversary, you know, and every once in a while, hey, did you know your birthday was tomorrow? Oh, I forgot, you know, that type of thing, so it's pretty cool uh, for us, anyway, and some people, I mean, some people are really big on this Sabbath, you know, they're really big on that. There, some people believe the Sabbath is Saturday, other believe, believe it's Sunday, well, it's the Lord's Day. That's the Lord's Day. You can't do this on the Lord's Day. You've got to do certain things. Well, that's, that's great. That's okay. That's where they're at. But, you know, what's to say? We don't judge them for that. You know, in fact, I, I, people that do that to me, I think, are honorable a lot of times. They honor a day like that. I don't think that under the New Covenant that, that there is a, a particular day uh, that, we're, that we're following the Sabbath like we did. The Sabbath, I believe, is different now under the New Covenant than it was under the Old Covenant. Under the Old Covenant, is one day a week. Under the New Covenant, it's every day. Under the New Covenant, I think we actually become the Sabbath. We become the rest of God. We understand Jesus said that, the, uh, that, that man wasn't made for the Sabbath. The Sabbath was made for man. Okay, so we begin to understand those type of things under the new covenant. And we don't sit there and judge people who don't, you know, do that. And, but, you know, we, we should be honoring God every day, right? We should honor God every day. Okay, so one esteems every day like each. Let each, watch this, let each be fully convinced in his own mind. If that's something that you feel to do, you feel that Sunday you shouldn't work, you shouldn't, you know, or whatever you want to do, then, then that's fine. Don't do it. Follow the, as long as you're following the Lord, that's, that, that's okay. Follow your own conviction, okay? If you're okay with that and feel that you shouldn't, you know, do certain things on Sunday, then don't, don't do certain things on Sunday, you know? Some people would say, you know, I, they won't watch an R-rated movie on Sunday, but the rest of the other six days is fine, okay? You know, just, just don't do it on Sunday. But, you know, whatever, however, wherever your conviction is on that, okay? He who observes the day, people do observe those days. They observe it to the Lord. That's how they do it. They really get excited. People get excited about Easter, you know, Resurrection Sunday. They really do. And I think that's great. That's awesome. You know, to me, it's just another Sunday. But, you know, because, I, because, I, I, because Jesus, it's Resurrection Day every day to me. But I know, I know it excites certain people. That's great. I, I, I kind of get excited too. I, you know why I really get excited about Resurrection Sunday? Because everybody else does. It's like the one Sunday we're all on the same page. That's awesome. I'm like, all right. Everybody else is believing Jesus is raised. Now we're all walk, we're all walking in it now. So I do get excited about that. Uh, some people get real excited about Christmas. You know, really good. We celebrate the birth of the Lord. That, that's I like it too. I like the season. That's that's fun. Okay. Um, and and that's okay. That's what it, that's what Paul's saying. It's okay if you do, and it's okay if you don't. That's the point, right? He observes one day, observes it to the Lord. He who does not observe the day to the Lord, he doesn't observe it. He who eats, eats to the Lord, he gives God thanks. He who doesn't do it, eat in that manner, okay, to the Lord, he doesn't eat, and he still gives God thanks. You can eat meat, give God thanks. You can eat vegetables, and you can give God thanks. As long as you're all giving God thanks, what's the difference, right? That's the point. That's the point, okay? Uh, and, and, but you understand what the law does. The law esteems one person by putting somebody else down. That's what the law does. The law will pick, it promotes self-righteousness is what it does. It makes you feel good because you're observing a particular day and, some, and what makes it so good? Because somebody else isn't. That makes you better than them. That's the law. That's what the law does. The law makes people better than other people based on their action, based on observing a particular day, based on something they eat, based on where they go, based on their behavior, based on what they do. They're better than somebody else. That's what the law does. That's what it does. Hallelujah. Tony, you can go back. You can go ahead back. Good to see you, bud. 
All right. None, verse 7, none of us lives to himself, and, none, none, uh, and no one dies to himself. If we live, we live to the Lord, and if we die, we die to the Lord. Therefore, whether we live or die, we're the Lord's. We belong to God, in other words, okay? For to this end, Christ died and rose and, and uh, lived again, that he might be Lord, both the dead and the living. Why do you judge your brother? Why? Paul's asking. Why do you do that? Why do you show contempt for your brother? Because, watch it. For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. There's that law again, see? We're all going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. You want to sit there and ju judge, let God judge them. See, we, do, we spend too much time looking at other people and worrying about what they're doing or what they're not doing and what they should be doing. And just worry about yourself, right? Just take care between you and God. It's written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee is going to bow to me, every tongue is going to confess uh, to God. So then each of us, has to, give him, has to give account of himself to God. You're not giving account for somebody else. They have to do that, okay? Therefore, let us not judge one another anymore. Pretty simple, right? Pretty simple. Simply said, not easy to do, though, is it? But rather resolve this, not to put a stumbling block or cause the fall in, or, or, or cause the fall in our brother's way. I know and I'm convinced by the Lord Jesus that there's nothing unclean of itself. That's what Paul's saying. I'm okay with that. That's what he says. Now, he's going back to the law. He's using food because that was a big deal. Okay? Um, under, under the law, there were foods that were clean or unclean. Okay? You were permitted to eat certain things. You're not permitted to eat certain things. Under the new covenant, that no longer applies. Okay, I eat things under the new covenant that I would not be permitted to eat under the old covenant. Okay, I have eaten reptiles. That was not permitted. Okay, I've had frog legs. They're not bad. Okay, no, I don't eat a lot of them. But uh, I've had alligator. And it was good. I wouldn't recommend eating it up here because they're not fresh up here. See? But, but I was in the Amazon jungle, so it was pretty, pretty fresh stuff, you know what I mean? It was pretty good, actually. Um, I've had that. Now, under the law, I wouldn't be able to eat that. Now, most people aren't going to probably eat those kind of things, but maybe you've had some bacon. Maybe you had some pork. Maybe you had ham. Okay, under the law, not permitted. Unclean. See, that's an unclean animal. Now, that's not healthy food, but it's still... It's still, un, it's still not unclean according to the Word of God, right? How many know you give thanks for it and bless it and eat it, you know? Uh, we've had those things here. We did a pig roast in our parking lot one time, okay? That's not, that's not permitted under the law, under the Old Covenant. But under the New Covenant, it's been declared clean, okay? Hallelujah. Where am I at here? I'm convinced by the Lord Jesus there's nothing unclean of itself, but to him who considers anything to be unclean, to him it is. But see, now it comes back to how you, how you view it. If you think it's unclean and not good, then to you it is. That's what I tell people with, when, when they ask me about faith. I say, well, you know, they say, well, I, I don't believe that's going to happen. I said, well, it, guess what? It won't. It won't happen because you don't believe that. But guess what? I believe it. You know, people say, you know, we've had people talk about um, our church is kind of known for miracles, having miracles, seeing signs and wonders and things happening, you know, regularly. I mean, ongoing, okay? Some talk about it, but it's usually, you know, some, sometimes it's in the past. You ever talk to people like that? I remember way back when we used to see the power of God move. Okay, that's, well, that's good. That's okay. But, you know, but ongoing, we see it here. And, uh, you know, pretty regularly with miracles, signs and wonders. We don't want to take those for granted. Always give God praise for those kind of things, and we're grateful for that. But, you know, people will say, well, we don't believe in that stuff. Okay? What don't you believe? We don't believe signs and wonders take place today. We don't believe in miracles. We don't believe in gifts of the healing. We don't believe supernatural things. And, uh, and here's what they'll usually say. We don't believe that stuff. We never see anything like that. So it's probably a connection there. You see, that's the reason you don't see stuff like that is because you don't believe stuff like that. And so the opposite is, well, guess what? We believe that, therefore we see that. See the difference? Why do we see it? Because we believe it. Why do people not see it? Because they don't believe it. Pretty simple. I like to make things simple. You know what I mean? Let's just keep it simple. All right. 
Yet, if your brother's grieved because of your food, okay, don't invite him over for dinner. <laughs> You're no longer walking in love. Don't destroy with your food the one for whom Christ lo- died. Listen. If you're having a steak dinner, don't invite vegans. You know what I mean? They might not be able to handle that. They're, they're, they're going to have a hard time with you sitting there chewing that meat in front of them. They're just going to be like, oh, man, that's just turning my stomach. You know, just don't invite them to dinner, you know, if you're having a steak dinner. Now, if you're having, if you're having a tea or some salad or something like that, then invite them for that. You know, just kind of be sensitive. Be sensitive to where other people are at, right? Isn't that what it's saying? Pretty much. Just make it practical, okay? Make it practical. Um, Don't destroy with your food the one for whom Christ died. Therefore, don't let your good be spoken of as evil. Now, here comes this this famous scripture. And I wanted to put it in the context. For the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking. That's not the kingdom of God. It's righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. We all quote that verse, right? But what was the context of it? The context was it of it was that it was it was the the difference between the old covenant and new covenant. The kingdom of God is not about a bunch of rules. It's not about eating and drinking, but specifically when it says eating and drinking, it's specifically talking about under the rules of the law. Okay? That's what it's saying. So he's saying that's not what the kingdom of the kingdom of God is not following the law. It's not rules and regulations about what to eat, what not to eat, and if you put it in the whole context of it, or observing certain days or whatever, because the kingdom of God, Jesus said, does not come with observance, observances. The kingdom of God is within. The kingdom of God is what? Righteousness, peace, joy. I believe, this is my opinion, I believe there's an order to that. I believe that that is in order. Righteousness, peace, joy. I believe there's an order to it. I believe that you cannot have peace without righteousness. You cannot have joy without peace. I believe there's an absolute order and that your foundation must be righteousness. It must come first. Everything is established upon righteousness. Righteousness is the authority of the kingdom. Let me show you that um, real quick. It's in Hebrews. Chapter number 1. Verse 8. Hebrews 1. Verse 8, to the Son he says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. Now watch this. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of your kingdom. What's a scepter? It is a symbol of authority. Who holds it? A king. Okay. So the king, this was the, this was the, this was the item that was put toward Esther. The scepter, see, in order to permit her to come into his presence remember that it represents authority so when it's saying when anytime when you see this word scepter it's talking about authority in the kingdom so the scepter of what righteousness 111 right oh that should be 18. excuse me a scepter of righteousness is the scepter of your kingdom so the the righteousness is the foundation of your authority. That's why you have authority. That's what gives you authority. Righteousness is a position in the kingdom that every believer has. And it's from that position that gives you authority on this earth. That's your authority. Your authority stems from and is founded upon righteousness. How'd you get it? By faith in Jesus. That's how you got it. You did not get it because you did a lot of awesome stuff. You didn't earn it, in other words. Righteousness cannot be earned because if righteousness is earned, it becomes self-righteousness. And there's no authority in the kingdom of God with self-righteousness. So see, not all righteousness has authority. Only God's righteousness has authority. Self-righteousness has no authority in the kingdom of God. Okay? Because it comes from self Righteousness from God, see, comes from Him. He who knew no sin, uh, 2 Corinthians 5, what is it, 21. He who knew no sin, what? Became sin. So that we might become the righteousness of God in Christ. So what happened is we received His righteousness. That's what makes you righteous. You're righteous because it's His righteousness. 
You've received his righteousness, therefore, along with that comes his authority. So when you received righteousness, you received his authority. That's what gives you authority over demonic spirits. That's what gives you dominion upon this earth. It's all based upon righteousness, and it's his. It's his righteousness that's been delegated unto you. Okay, does this make sense? All right, so that's where it comes from. Righteousness then will lead to peace. Because you understand your righteousness, understand who you are, you now have peace with God. You have peace with God. There's a peace there. There's an inner peace of knowing you belong to God. He belongs to you. That just get, that, there's such a peace in that. There's a peace that surpasses what? All understanding. It guards your hearts and your mind. And that peace comes because you're founded upon righteousness. That's your authority. Now that just gives you perfect peace. You have peace in every situation. You have peace because you trust God. Because you know you're His. You belong to Him. And with, along with peace comes next. If, you have, if you're established in righteousness and you know that, and you walk in God's peace, guess what happens automatically? Joy. That's a strength. Okay? You're joyful. You just have this joy. You just, you just look at the things that are going on in the world and you laugh. I do sometimes. I scratch my head a lot. That's why I'm losing hair up here, I think. These last few years, I've been doing that a lot. Going, what the heck? Who could think like that? Who would do such a thing? I'm scratching my head all the time, and I'm wearing that out up there. All right. So what happens is, okay, in the garden, I was thinking about this today. In the garden, the, the first garden that God created, okay, the Garden of Eden, and he put the man there, and he said, let's go back. I'll just go back there. Okay, chapter 2, Genesis chapter 2. <laughs> That God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed. Okay, so the man is in the garden. Adam, right? Adam. Now, I've said this before, but let me just say it again, just so, just so everybody, so because some people have a hard time with the concept. Adam was both male and female. You got that? Okay, Adam. Adam was both of them. The man and the woman was both called Adam. Okay? Her name, she, she never got a name until she was cast out of the garden. Okay? When she was first created by God, they, they were called Adam. They, male and female, they were both called Adam. Okay? You got that? Adam was both, it was, not, it was a non-gender word, we'll put it that way. Adam is a non-gender word. Adam, now even if you refer to Adam now, you refer to the old nature, the old man. That's your Adam nature, okay? So anyway, just wanted to, to clarify that. Uh, Adam was just the name of mankind. Whether it was male or female, everybody was called Adam, okay, at the time, at the beginning. After they sinned, okay, and the woman then, okay, lost her position, basically. Man lost his, woman lost hers, and that's when she, she became, uh, had, had her own identity and name. Okay. okay, that's a whole other thing. Okay, so anyway, in the garden, Adam, male and female. He had formed them. Out of the ground, verse 9, the Lord God made every tree grow that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. Every tree, pleasant to the sight, good for food. Tree of life was in the midst of the garden and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So here we have the two trees. I'm, I touched on this before. These, there was more than two trees though, right? There are all kinds of trees there. But the two trees, what was the significance of the two trees? Number one, they both had a name. The other trees were just trees. These ones were actually, had a name. One was called the tree of life. The other was called the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So they actually had a specific name for these two trees. The other thing about these two trees were where they were located. It was very significant. Where were they located? In the center of the garden, in the midst, in the middle. Okay, so now we begin to understand. We begin to understand that we're the garden. Okay, we're the garden. What's in the center of our garden? Even further center. Spirit. Spirit, spirit's the center, okay, in the midst. So what is produced okay now watch this I'm 
trying to I'm trying to not confuse myself with what I was sharing Sunday also. Um, can the spirit be defiled? Can the spirit be defiled? And we know that it can, right? Okay, it can be defiled. Paul talked about that in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, okay? Verse 1, about the spirit being defiled. Uh, it, it, it gets defiled based on what you allow in. Now, the part of the, part of the spirit that's, that, as a born-again believer that's God does not get defiled, cannot get defiled, but you can defile your spirit. You can sear your conscience. You, there's things you can do and allow, you know, to happen, to get to become defiled by opening doors, by allowing that, that type of thing in, okay? So that is what Jesus said, you are not defiled by what goes into you physically, okay? You cannot be defiled by physical things, right? That's what Jesus said. You're defiled by what's in here, inside, in the midst. Because Jesus said, you know, remember they got on the disciples for not washing their hands. They said, you're defiled because you didn't wash your hands. Jesus said, that's not how defilement works. He said, defilement does not come from outward things. He said, defilement comes from the heart. It comes by what you speak out of your mouth. Okay, not what goes into the mouth, but what comes out of the mouth. And he said, the reason is because what comes out of the mouth is coming from the heart or the spirit. Okay. That's what's coming out of the mouth. Envy and lies and strife and all, all kinds of stuff. That, bitterness. Those things come out from, from within, from your spirit man. Okay? And he said, that's what's bringing uh, defiling to you. So God makes this garden. Okay? And we understand that the two trees are the two covenants. The two covenants. One's the covenant for the old man. That's the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Paul said, without the knowledge of it, I, don't, I wouldn't even know I was sinning. So it has that knowledge of sin. Okay. Now, you have the other tree, which is the tree of life, which we know is the new covenant, which is really Jesus. Jesus is the tree of life. Okay. And so we want to partake. We know that as we partake of the fruit of the tree, that that's where we receive our nourishment. Okay, just like you would physical food, the same way with spiritual stuff. So as you begin to take things in and feed upon, the more you feed upon Jesus, what's going to happen? You're going to produce. What are you going to produce? You keep feeding on the tree of life, what are you going to produce? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self control You're going to produce the fruit of the Spirit because you've been feeding on the tree of life. What's going to happen when you feed on the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? Guess what's going to happen? You're going to start judging other people. You're going to start promoting yourself and self. It's going to, you're, going to promote, you're, going to, you're feeding upon the law, and it's feeding the old man is what it's feeding. Does it make sense? You're feeding upon that, okay, knowledge of good, evil. You're good, I'm, I'm evil, I'm good, you're evil. That's not good, that's bad, that's good, that's bad. Okay, we start pointing that stuff out. That's, that's living under the law and under judgment is what that does. God says, I don't want you, you eat from that tree, it's going to produce what? You're going to die. That leads to that. There's a, there is a way that seems right to man, but in the end, is death. it just seems right that we should be able to keep all these rules and be better than other people. That seems right. But in the end, that leads to death, right? Instead of just saying, let's just feed on Jesus. See? And then we got Cain and Abel. One fed from the tree of life, the other knowledge of good and evil. Compared themselves one to another. That's what Cain did until he judged his brother, then executed judgment on him, okay? Because he was angry because his brother was walking in faith. He wasn't. He was self-righteous, okay? So, tree of life, these, were in the, these two trees were in the middle of the garden. And there was a river, went out of Eden, the water the garden, and parted to become four river heads. So you got four rivers here. You got uh, Pishon and Havilah, and then you got where there's gold and Gion and Hittichel, which is really, um, it, it's the Tigris. You've got the Tigris and Euphrates, and you got the other two. And said, so, well, two of them, two of them are still here, and two of them aren't. Where'd they go? Well, I have a theory, okay? My theory is that they split whenever sin entered. Because basically Eden was heaven on earth. Heaven on earth. What happened? 
when sin happened. There was a separation between heaven and earth. Right? Separation. Man lost the glory of God. It left. Okay? My opinion is what happened is heaven and earth split at that moment. They were, that was one, see? And it split so that the waters above and the waters beneath split. I think those other two rivers are located in heaven. Okay? Especially the one with the gold, like it says. That's, a, that's in the heavenly realm. So it, it, the dimension changed at that moment. There was a shift in the, in the dimension of, of the heaven and earth together, which I believe with the way God created it, but, but it then separated. Okay? Why? Because what separates from God? What causes separation from God? Sin. Sin causes separation from God. So when man sinned, it's separ he separated from God. Okay? Now watch what happened then. Then the Lord God, verse 15, took the man, put him in the Garden of Eden to do what? To, to tend and to keep it. Okay? He entrusted man with his garden. He entrusted him. Gave him the authority to do it. And God commanded the man. Here's what he said. Of every tree of the garden, you can freely eat. Now, that's more than just the two, right? He said all, all the trees. He said they're all good. You can eat, you can eat uh, any one of them. Any one you can have. You can eat all the fruit you want. But, what he said, but of that tree, the knowledge of good and evil, do not eat that. You shall not eat in the day that you eat it. You shall surely die. So we have fruit. We have trees. We have all kind of trees. We have trees in the midst of the garden. In the midst. But we have trees out here too. Okay? So God's saying, you can eat from this tree and receive from Jesus. You can receive life. And this ought to be your main tree. That's why it's in the middle. But you can go out here and you can eat from these other trees as long as you keep them in perspective. You can go eat from the tree of hobbies that you like. You can go eat from the tree of the jobs that you do. You can go eat from healthy relationships. You can eat all these other trees. They don't always, everything you do does not have to be all, you know, uh, about Jesus. We like to say that. But you can go do and have some other fun and have some other things as long as you stay in the realm of the kingdom of God. Does this make sense? There's other trees you can feed on, but they shouldn't be in the center of the garden. Christ should always be the center, see? He should always be the main. Seek first his kingdom, his righteousness. It all ought to be Christ. You understand what I'm saying? I'm not saying go out and do things to, to, to go apart from Christ. I'm just saying there's other things in your life that you're a part of. You got jobs, okay? You got hobbies. You got relationships that you have. You got all these things that you do. Those are other, as long as they're good trees, you can eat from those, okay? Just keep the perspective right that Christ is always at the center. Does that make sense? I think you guys are hearing something you never heard before. I think I'm giving you a license to go do something. I, mean, I know it doesn't sound spiritual. Guess what? We're in a human body. I don't always look spiritual. Okay? I know when you look at me, you see that glow and that halo and everything like that. But I like other things, okay? I like motorcycles, you know, and things like that. And I, you know, I try to spiritualize everything I do. But, you know, I don't know if I can spiritualize riding a motorcycle. I, you know, it's kind of, I can sometimes make that stuff up, but make it sound good. But I just want to be honest, you know what I'm saying? I'm just saying that when God said that, he's saying you can eat from all, they're all good. Nothing in and of itself is necessarily evil, okay? You have the Spirit of God to be led in, right? You can do other things. Okay, you don't have to be in church 24-7, right? But you have the Spirit of God 24-7, okay? You understand? It's okay to have some hobbies and have some other interests and have some of these other things. Eat from them, just don't lose the perspective. Keep Christ at the center, okay? All right. Don't stone me now. So he says, he said, this is what I want you to do. I don't want you to eat from that tree to knowledge of good and evil, though. Because that tree is going to set you in the wrong path and it's going to lead you to death. And he says, okay, that's when he, then he, the, this is when he forms the woman, okay? Forms the woman. Well, I, that's a whole other thing. I'm, I don't have time to get into that. Okay. So then we come down to chapter 3. Let's start in chapter 3. The serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field that the Lord had made. Okay? Now here, 
in this context, we don't understand that the serpent itself was representing, who's the serpent representing here? Yeah, this is the devil, right? The devil. And he said to the woman, has God indeed said that you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? Has God said that? Has God indeed said, you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? Is that a true statement? Depends, I guess, depends on how you look at it. So I guess he, he did say, you shall not eat of every tree. He said you can eat of every one but one. Right? But see, the enemy's sly. And he likes to kind of, he likes to use trickery and deception, and he likes to twist words around. You know what I mean? I just kind of twist those things around a little bit. Make them say things, you know. This is how you know the devil's in politics. You know what I mean? Because politicians do this all the time. Okay, I like to twist stuff and do that. Okay, so anyway, here we go. So he's, he's, he asked her this question. Now understand, like, understand this. You got you to understand this. Cause I've, if you're having a conversation with a devil or a demon, don't get fooled into thinking that they're, they care about you or that they have your best interests in mind. You know, I'm talking to people that have conversations with demonic spirits. Okay. Now, the demonic spirit is in the form of someone when it comes to them, some maybe relative that died years ago or whatever, and we know that demonic spirits can take on a form of a body, so they come and they have ongoing conversations with people. And I'm thinking, okay, or fortune tellers, going to fortune tellers and stuff like that. I'm like, okay, now, do you know what spirit, well, what they said was good, was it? The devil says a lot of things that are good. He'll even quote scripture. I mean, scripture is good, right? Devil quotes scripture. Does that make him good? No, because guess what? It, you got to know this. Just because something sounds good, you've got to understand the source. If the source is the devil, and his job is what? Still kill and destroy. That's the only thing he's trying to do. Now, in order to do that with people that have some kind of intelligence, hopefully you know, born-again believers, he's got to start to trick you first and make you think he cares about you, make you think he's telling truth, make you think that he's going to help you out, okay? Right there, if you have any thoughts like that, that he's good, that this is good, this is a great conversation, wow, he's going to be helpful, he's telling me things that, you know, that, that's good for me. Now, listen, he's got, the only, the only agenda he's got is to steal, kill, and destroy, and he'll do whatever it takes to get you to that point. He'll lure you in, make it look good, make it sound good. He's got one goal, and that's to destroy you. If you're having conversations with demonic spirits, you need to stop having those kinds of conversations. They're tricks. They're liars. Okay? Don't do that. <clears throat> Where am I at? So the woman said, we may eat. We may eat the fruit of the trees of the garden. We can do that. God said we're, we're allowed to do that. Okay? So she's right. But... Of the fruit of the tree that's in the midst of the garden, God said, you shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. Now this is interesting because she didn't make a distinction because there were two trees in the midst of the garden, but she didn't say that. She was already forgot. There were two trees in the middle of the garden. One was a tree of life, one was a tree of knowledge of good and evil. And she's basically telling the, the enemy that God said, we're not to eat of those trees. We're not to eat of the tree in the middle of the garden, except the tree of life was in the middle of the garden. See how she's already confused. She's got confusion has already entered in. Then she gets in that you shall not touch it, lest you shall die. And the serpent said, you will not surely die. Now right there is an absolute blatant lie. That is absolutely contradictory to what God said. And at that moment, if you, even if you had any inkling, if you had any idea that maybe, maybe this, this, this serpent's telling the truth, maybe he's not so bad, at that moment, right there, that should have been the end of the conversation, right there. That should have been it. 
As soon as he said anything that contradicted God's word right there, you have to know, right? right? From then on, there ought to be nothing you're listening to, okay? Because this is not good. He's contradicting the word of God. He's, t- he's basically, what did he do right there? What did he insinuate? Yes. He insinuated that God was a liar. The devil is insinuating to the woman that God is a liar. And then he goes on to explain. You're not going to die. He said, for God knows, God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Now what's he insinuating? He's insinuating, first of all, he insinuated that God's a liar. Now he's insinuating to the woman that God's holding something back from you. That there's good, there's good things here that God doesn't want you to have. But you can have them. You can get them. They, you know, God's trying to keep these from you. He doesn't want you. You see, anytime, anytime the enemy has you questioning God's goodness, God, I wonder if God, maybe God really doesn't love me. Maybe God really is mad at me. Maybe God really doesn't have my best interest. See, anytime you've got those kind of questions going on, the enemy's already accomplished his goal. He's got you questioning God. Got you doubting God. God's will for your life. God's blessing for you. You know, you're already doubting that. And that's what happened. And that's what, that's what led her down the wrong path. That led them into the path of sin because they started questioning God's motives. And started believing the enemy over God. So the woman now, what does she do? See, by having this conversation with the enemy, she made provision. What we talked, what we just talked about in Romans 14, she made provision for sin. See, she made she made the provision already. Made provision for sin. Look, <laughs> what did I tell people whenever they, you know, it's cold season. When cold season comes and people run out to buy their cold medication ahead of time, I'm like, you're making provision for it. You're expecting it. You're ready for it. I'm going to go stock up on the cold medication. What are you, what are you saying? You're saying, well, I'm, I'm planning on getting this, so I'm just going to go stock up on the medication. I heard the one guy who was talking about his, um, he, he was a real um, penny pincher, and his wife went and got NyQuil. And uh, he said, you know, there's an expiration date on that stuff. He goes, she bought a three-pack. He's like, we're never going to use three-pack. He goes, that's it. He goes, from now, he said, you're going to start sending the kids out without a coat on and with wet hair. He goes, we're going we're to make sure we use this all up. He was, a, he was a comedian. Okay, so anyway, just a joke, just a joke. All right. So anyway, okay, so she saw the woman was good. Or she saw, the woman saw that the tree was good for food. The tree's good for food. It was pleasant to the eyes, and it was a tree desirable to make one wise. And she took of its fruit and ate. This is what we read in 1 John, right? Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. That's all right there. Okay. She also gave her husband with her, and he ate. And the eyes of both of them were open, and they knew they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. Okay, you've heard me talk about that just recently. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord among the trees of the garden. Isn't this interesting? Because sin drives you from God. They went and got away from the middle of the garden where the tree of life was. Now here it is again. And what they do? They went out and hid themselves in the other trees. Maybe hid themselves in a career. Maybe hid themselves in an ungodly relationship. Maybe hid themselves in some hobbies. Pulled themselves away from the things of God. Hid themselves from God by getting involved in everything else but the things of God. Ran from God. That's what they did. Got into the other trees, the trees that were meant for good in proper perspective, 
but they got the perspective wrong, left God, then went out, uh, went out among all the other trees that were not the tree of life. Pulled themselves away from Jesus. In guilt, condemnation, shamed, let people leave church all the time. Because they come to church and they get convicted by the Holy Spirit, so they don't want that. So they hide themselves in other trees. They hide themselves in other things. They stay involved in other areas. Stay away from the Word of God. Stay away from praise. Stay away from other believers. Stay away where they can feel comfortable so that they, because, because they get into an area where the Spirit of God is and their sin feels very uncomfortable in those areas. And because they don't want to change, it's better just to hide themselves in the other areas and cover up their sin. That's what they do, just cover their sin up. So they stay away. They retreat. Make sense? And God's after them. They're hiding from God, as if you can hide from God. Interesting, huh? So, let me see where we're going to go here. I don't think I have time to say all this about the kingdom of God. So we know that what we, we, Jesus tells a parable, uh, the most famous parable that he tells, that we call the parable of the sower, but it would actually probably be more, more accurate to call the parable of the soils. Okay? Because actually, the, so what he, what he told, we all know the parable, it's in, it's, all, it's in all four Gospels, of the sower who goes to sow. We understand that the sower was God, right? This, what did he sow? He sowed seed. What was the seed? It's the Word of God, right? Jesus explained the parable, okay? So he sowed the seed. Now, what we find out is this, that the seed is the constant. The seed doesn't change. The same seed went on each of the different soils. But the seed grew better in certain soils, right? That's the parable. So... It's not, there's no problem with the seed. It wasn't that bad seed went there and good seed went, no. It was all good seed. It was all God's word. So we find out that seed will grow if it's given the proper environment. And we are responsible for our environment. So when this word of God comes to us, right, and we have the proper environment, then it will grow. It will produce fruit. If it doesn't have the proper environment, it won't produce, right? Pretty simple. Okay, so the soil is, our, is us, our heart, basically. We receive the Word of God, okay? We want to receive the Word of God. It will grow if we give it the right environment. Certain things grow in environments, and they don't grow in other environments, okay? We find that out with certain people, uh, with, with, even within your body. There's, there's, things, there's things that you can do for your body, okay? You can create an environment for your body that will resist, okay, disease, Healthy, there is a way, okay, and it's not, not, not to condemn because we already talked about that, right? But you can eat healthy food. You can build your immune system up. What are you doing? You're creating an environment that makes it very difficult, very difficult for disease to live or stay in and remain in that kind of environment. Or you can eat a lot of other stuff, a lot of crappy food, a lot of junk food. You can eat all that kind of stuff. And what are you doing? You're creating an environment where seeds of disease and other stuff they just thrive in that kind of environment okay we know overall in general that an environment of acid produces bad stuff it just produces bad things okay sicknesses and diseases uh, uh, an environment of alkaline an alkaline environment is very difficult to grow a seed of disease in an alkaline environment it just doesn't grow in that and so there's things that God, in his, with, with the wisdom that he's given us, has shown us things that we can be, you know, getting our bodies built up. We can build our bodies up. We can build our immunity up. Our bodies have been made to resist things like that, okay? So we can do that uh, because of the environment. The same thing happens in the spiritual, 
okay? Things that you allow into your life start, there, there's, there's soils in there. I mean, when you get the right, when you get the right soil, the, as something enters in, you get a seed of sin that enters in, it won't grow there if you have the right environment. Your body will reject it. It'll say, that doesn't feel right. That doesn't sound right. That does, something's not right about that. I don't want that in my body. I don't want that in my garden. Kicking that thing out of the garden. I'm pulling that thing out by the roots. That's not good. That's going to produce the wrong thing. And then there's other things that, man, that bears witness with my spirit. That's good stuff. I'm going to keep feeding on that. That's good. That's the Word of God. That's just filling me up with joy and peace and love and just, that's good stuff. I want to keep that in there because I have an environment that that grows in. Those seeds just grow nice in that environment. So see, we're responsible for the environment of our heart. We're responsible for what we let in, what we permit in. And we want, as we permit the right things in, the right things grow in there. Does this make sense? You notice I kind of went full circle a little bit here tonight. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for that, because I wasn't planning on that, but that went pretty good. You know, with the, so as, you, as you, um, you know, create the right environment, as you feed upon the right thing then, it bears witness with it. It comes right in there, it grows, it, it's nurtured, and, and it's producing good fruit, and that's where we want to be. We want that, and we want to produce that fruit from the tree of life. That's where we want to get nourishment from. If you, if you eat enough of the tree of life, you know, and that's a constant for you, them other trees aren't swaying you out of the... Uh, th th what happens, see, when you're in the right perspective, it all becomes good. But when you don't have the tree of life, now you're in the trees, you're hiding from God, you just, it's not good because you're putting all these other stuff first. As long as you keep the tree of life first in your life, it's okay to go eat on some other things, okay? Not sin, obviously, but other, just other things. It's okay to do that. God created it all. He said he created it for our good. He created a world. For what? How's it really? For his pleasure, right? For his pleasure. He created the world for his pleasure. Okay? God didn't cre God created all kinds. Of, created animals, created trees, plants, all kind of fun stuff. Okay? Created beautiful scenery, made it all different, wanted us to go enjoy it. Amen? So we can go enjoy stuff like that. He, he created us to do all that. Have dominion over those kind of things. Right? Live life. Have fun. All right, praise God. Uh, maybe get into this next week about the kingdom. I'm going to kind of compare the kingdom uh, with the way Paul did uh, with the Roman Empire and the Senate and the church and what this church is. You know, the church isn't a social club. You understand that? You know, the church is created as a governing, a, a governing body. That's why they use terms like ecclesia, okay, and what that means, that word, what that word means and what that means to you practically today. Okay, and so uh, that's I think that's where I'll go next week. We'll talk about the kingdom of God and how that how that relates and where the church's purpose is in the world here today. Okay, as part of the kingdom and what that means, the rule on this earth, like we've been called to do. Amen. All right. Heavenly Father, I thank you and praise you for this time. Look into your word. I thank you that your word is nourishment. I thank you, Lord, that the tree of life, which is you, you're the new covenant. That tree is what we feed on and we keep that tree in the center of our garden. At all times. We thank you that you created other trees. Lord, we can receive uh, from those other trees also, but always in the perspective of you first. Always in the perspective of you first. And we give you praise for that in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. 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 God bless you all. Love you guys. Thanks for coming. Good to see you, Pastor.